Hi, I'm Sandy Milkey, and I hope you're enjoying this community non-denominational Bible study through the Gospel of John. In this Gospel, we find drama, humor, irony, but most of all, we see the burning passion of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, to obey his Father, whose burning desire is to redeem us. I'm so glad you can join us on this journey. Today we are going to be talking about John 9 and recognizing blindness. And this has been a fun, a fun, fun lesson for me as we have examined, as we're going to examine a man who was born blind and is healing. So before we start, I, I felt like we needed to go back a couple of chapters because John is very systematic in the events and stories that he chooses to illustrate points he wants to make. Jesus, commit, Jesus performed thousands of miracles, and John mentions only seven. So when he tells two stories, very similar in nature, of two men who were healed on the Sabbath, to me, out of seven, two of those are very similar. I think we need to take a closer look at what those two stories might have in common. So let's go back to chapter 5. The man who had been an invalid for 38 years is healed. And Jesus asked that man, do you want to get well? This man, I think, represents the Jews who had a portion of the truth. They knew that God, they knew about God. They were alive but sick. This man thought he needed to get into the pool to be healed. He was confused about the path to spiritual life. Jesus healed this man, and when he did that, he said, pick up your bed roll and go home. Don't live as an invalid any longer. Now, when, when you can walk after 38 years of lying on a mat, who wants to go back to that mat? He said, leave your life of legalism. That's the message that this is symbolically saying. So Jesus spends, spent the rest of that chapter explaining that he only does what he sees the Father doing. You're going to hear me say that a lot. And until I started doing a deep study of John, I had no idea what that meant or even that Jesus referred to it like over and over and over again. It's just, it, it becomes his major focus in the, all these chapters. So now we get to chapter nine and we see a man with congenital blindness. This man, blind from birth, now represents the Gentiles. They represent us, those people who had never heard about God or his plan of salvation. So these are the things in today's session that I want you to look for. First of all, the man's journey took time. It was a journey of discovery. It wasn't just instantaneous. It was like, okay, one second he's blind, the next second he's, he's healed. It, there, this journey takes time. I also want you to see that people often experience trouble and rejection, even when they are in the perfect will of God. I want you to see that when Jesus is all you have, Jesus is all you need. And this message of grace was both the seeker and the scorner. But it's ultimately only the humble who receive it because the proud reject it. And Jesus lived as an example and told total dependency on his father. So let's get started. John 1, John 9 verse 1 says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. To get the context of this story, let's go back to the very last verse of last chapter. The Jews are deeply angered by Jesus' accusations that they are liars and children of Satan. Hmm, can you figure that out? Why would they be mad about that? So they're so mad at Jesus that they try to kill him in the temple and they pick up stones. As we start this chapter, it says, as he passed by. Now, the context here is putting those two verses together, is that the people are kind of blocking the way of the Pharisees, and Jesus and his disciples are just making their way, slipping on out of the temple, getting away from the Pharisees. And as Jesus is passing by, he sees this man who has been born blind. And this man who has been born blind knows he's blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, 
do you hear the, the connotation there? Someone sinned. It's going to be either this man or his parents. Now, let's go back to, we're going to talk about this man for the majority of this chapter, but let's talk about the parents for just a moment. His parents, when this child was born, he was blind. I don't know when, at what point they understood he was blind, but from very early, from days old. Back then, it wasn't like, oh, we're gonna send him to the school for the blind, or there are all of these choices that you can have to teach you how to live a productive life if you're blind. Back then, there was one choice. If you were blind, you were going to be a beggar for your life. That was how you were going to make your income. You were born, if you were born blind, that was, that was going to be your life, and the parents knew it. And can you imagine how they would have felt when they knew that their son had been born blind? That all of the dreams that they had for maybe him taking care of them in their old age, or, you know, whatever dreams they had for him, they just went up in smoke because they saw him for what he truly was. He was blind. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now let's get to the, the blind man. I wonder how often he heard that. It's bad enough to be blind without feeling like people are looking at you and going, oh, what did you do? How did you deserve this? Do we ever feel that way? That's how this man, I think, was probably feeling. And this question, I have to think that this, this to me sounds like John, the writer of this gospel. He was the youngest by quite a bit for, of all of these, these disciples. And when I did some study, he's probably in his mid-teens, maybe. And he was kind of the spoiled brat of the, the family of disciples. And he is the younger cousin of a much older Jesus. So he is wanting the approval of his hero, of his beloved cousin, his beloved rabbi. And so it's like John is, you know, some people just have to say something. They don't really want an answer, but they just have to say something. You kind of get the attention on them. And that just is kind of what this feels like. But can you imagine whoever it was that asked that question, and Jesus starts to indicate that he might do something about this. Can you imagine the glares that the disciples would would put their, would stare their way? It's like, shut up. If you give him a chance, he's going to heal this guy. And it's the Sabbath, and we are just now escaping death. But let's get back to the man. This time, the question was directed to a rabbi. Rabbis knew stuff. And this man or his parents were to blame. So that's what Jesus is telling this man. You're not to blame. He probably never ever heard that before. Jesus is telling him this, the works of God are going to be displayed in you. What? And then Jesus goes on to say, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is again claiming that dependency. You are going to see this over and over and over again in these chapters, and this is going to climax at the cross. Jesus's ministry had up until this point almost solely been focused on the Jews. This story foreshadows Jesus bringing the Gentiles in, and it's what Isaiah prophesied, and it was also quoted again in Matthew. Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness, have seen a great light, going from blindness to light. The man, blind from birth, physically represents the spiritual conditions of the Gentiles who had never heard the gospel before. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. So Jesus spit. <laughs> Doesn't that sound wonderful? He made mud. He smeared it on the man's eyes and then told him to go wash in a pool that was a fair ways away. I did some research and one of the, one of the sites said it was probably a thousand yards. It was right outside of the city gates. So he would have to come down from the Temple Mount, 
to go down outside the gates of the city and to this pool called Siloam. Jesus, the sent one, sent the man to watch in a pool called sent. Now, you see, Jesus didn't heal him immediately. The man had a choice. He could choose whether he wanted to be sent or not. And that pool was the lowest point in the historic city. It, geographically, it was the lowest altitude in the city. So that lowest point was this man's starting point. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. You see, like the parents, the neighbors only saw him as he was. They saw him now as a beggar. He was blind and he's begging. But the transformation in this man's life was startling, so startling, so transformational that not even the neighbors were recognizing him. They had to be convinced. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and he sa and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. You see in verse 11, it says he anointed my eyes. I think maybe when Jesus was putting making spit or making mud out of spit and putting it on his eyes. He probably doesn't think, he, oh, he's anointing my eyes. Do you see how a miracle changes a person's perspective? John mentions clay several times, and it harkens back to Genesis when God formed us from the dust of the ground, breathed into our nostrils, and we became living beings. Clay represents humanity. Jesus put clay on the man's eyes. You know what? If you want to get from point A to point B, you have to know you're at point A. And that's where Jesus wanted to make sure he, the man knew he was clay. He was humanity. He also wanted him to know that sickness and deformity are often just the result of the fall, of, of man's fall in the Garden of Eden. It's not necessarily this man's fault, the parents' fault. It's just the result of Thousands of years of cumulative sin. Jesus didn't condemn him. Do you see that? Isn't that amazing? He just simply diagnosed his problem. You're human and you're blind. Wow. I'm human. I'm blind. And we have a Savior that's come to save us. The man received his physical healing. His spiritual healing wasn't far behind. The man sent to the pool of Siloam, the pool called sent, by the one sent from God, is now sent to others to share his testimony. And you know, I had to stop and think about that for a little bit. Why, what, what would be the significance of that? And you know, when we become believers in Christ, when we place our trust, we are called to be sent ones. We are called to share our faith. And new Christians often hesitate to share their faith because they feel like they don't know enough. And that's not only just for new Christians. Christians in general, we feel like, oh, I, what if they ask me something I don't know? So this man encourage us, encourages us to share what we know. He didn't embellish anything. It was just a straightforward retelling of the facts. And when a question stumped him, he simply said, you know what? I don't know. Great answer. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Those weasels, what are they doing? They're dragging this poor guy who has never before seen in his life. They're dragging him before the Pharisees because they know that the Pharisees and Jesus have this headbutting going on. They were probably in the temple when the Pharisees were trying to kill him. And those weasels, what are they doing? They don't want to get themselves in trouble. They want to be able to say to the Pharisees, we told you when this happened. And of course, it happened on the Sabbath day. Jesus deliberately challenged those stupid, petty traditions that didn't fulfill God's original intent for the law. 
The law simply stated, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It was just simply a day of rest given so people had permission to rest. But the Jews wrote volumes about what you could do on the Sabbath, what you couldn't, how far could you walk, how far couldn't you walk. And on the Sabbath, this, these are some of their rules. On the Sabbath, you couldn't spit, you could, you could spit on a rock because that wouldn't make mud. But if you spit in the dirt, that would make mud. And that was work, and so you couldn't spit in the dirt on the Sabbath. And the use of medicine was also forbidden on the Sabbath, because that was a form of work. And spit, in those days, was sometimes considered medicine. Then the Pharisees also were asking him, again, how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. To the Pharisees, the man gave a shortened version of his testimony. He applied clay to my eyes. I washed, I see. Then... Given that testimony, the Pharisees start bickering back and forth among themselves. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. He is a bad man. How can a sinner do these things? And I had to think, does that second argument sound at all familiar to you? Maybe we can go back to the, second, the third chapter of John and see what Nicodemus, when he first came to Jesus, said. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. I'm thinking that was maybe Nicodemus' statement. How can a sinner perform such signs? The Pharisees turned back to this man who was born blind. Wow, it was you he healed after all. What do you think? The poor man had probably never ever in his entire life been asked to give his opinion. And so thinking they actually wanted to hear his opinion, and knowing that they're divided in what they're thinking among themselves, he actually gives it, honestly. I think he's a prophet. This is probably the only time the Pharisees ever saw the opinion of someone who they didn't think was their perceived equal. And as soon as he gives them that answer, they go, what were we thinking? Let's divert attention. Let's call in the parents. And, and uh, he doesn't know anything. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. The question them saying, is this your son who, who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. The Pharisees would rather believe that the man had never been blind than believe that Jesus had healed him. And so the parents, when called before the most powerful Israelites in the land, were fearful. The Pharisees could excommunicate them, and they knew it. What should have been the happiest day of their life was overshadowed by the iron-fisted rule of the Pharisees. So they throw their son under the bus. Yep, he's our son. How he now sees, we have no idea. You're going to have to ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He then answered, Whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. 
Now, give glory to God was their way of swearing in a witness. It was like, raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. That was their way of swearing in a witness. But what was new is they told him what they were expecting him to say. Here, just, just to clue you in, this is what we want you to say. This man is a sinner. But you know what? A life-changing miracle makes a man very bold indeed. Whether he's a sinner or not, I have no clue, he tells them. But this is one thing I do know. I was blind and I could see. So the Pharisees, if they can't argue facts, let's just argue the details. What did he do? How did he do it? The man sees their questions for what they really were. Hostility towards the one who had changed his life. Their attempts to intimidate him and discredit Jesus appear totally absurd to him. You know what? Your keen interest in this miracle is puzzling. Do you also? It also indicates that he is a disciple. Do you also want to become his disciples? The Pharisee's reaction is immediate. It's kind of like touching a hot stove. <gasps> you are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Moses has a proven track record, and this shiftless man is a mystery. He's not proven to us who he is. Now, how many miracles do you think it would have taken to prove to them that Jesus was actually the Son of God? He'd probably done thousands, maybe. <laughs> who knows? But no amount of miracles are going to convince them. The man answered and said to them, Oh, well, here's an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you're teaching us. So they put him out. The fledgling theologian was also a comedian. Your unbelief is a bigger miracle than my cure, he tells them. A miracle like mine has never, ever in the history of the world happened. And you want to argue about whether it's valid because Jesus did it on the wrong day? It's kind of like rejecting a diamond ring because somebody gives it to you in a plastic box. As he talked, the man's understanding of Jesus grew. And I have found that to be true in my life as well. As I talk about Jesus and brag on his grace and his mercy, I hear myself saying things that I didn't know, and my understanding of his love grows. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him. In the face of rejection, Jesus asked this man to make a decision about, about him, Jesus. The man was cautious about making unwarranted assumptions. He was pretty sure that God in the flesh stood before him, but he wanted to be sure. Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Unable to worship in the temple, the man worshipped at the feet of the one who owned the temple. How cool is that? Cast away from religion, he discovered relationship. One miracle birthed another. Yes, Lord, I believe. The one who healed him physically healed him spiritually. Jesus also rescued him from those naysayers around him, from the Pharisees with their legalism. You were healed on the wrong day by the wrong person. Who cares? I can see. The neighbors with their scorn and disdain. Oh, this isn't going to last. You're going to be back begging soon, depending on our generosity. Jesus kept finding the man at his lowest point. When he was blind, when he was cast out of the temple, excommunicated. I want you to get this. Do you see it? Jesus always does the seeking. You were healed on the right day by the right person. You've been kicked out of the temple. So I invite you to become the founding member of a church outside the temple. 
let you and me create this church and invite everyone who wants to come. Let's start something new. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we're not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Jesus now says that judgment is the reason he came. In the last chapter, he had said he didn't come into this world for judgment. So what's up with this? Is there a contradiction here? No, there's not a contradiction because what Jesus is talking about in this judgment is he's talking about judgment in a broader sense. Jesus himself is a spiritual dividing point. On one side are unbelievers, on the other side are believers. Some accept Jesus, others reject him. This judgment comes about as the result of choices individuals make for themselves. This, for themselves. this is not a judgment Jesus is making for them. He is just the dividing point at which when you come to this point, you choose this way or this way. And Jesus points out the tragedy of men who are really blind but insist they see. You know, it wasn't convenient or safe for Jesus to come and heal this man. He was under threat of death when he did it. And he was just now calling attention to himself. It also wasn't safe for him to come to earth to redeem us. This man's story is also ours. Do you see the invitation? Jesus saw a need took the initiative and invited the man to be healed. The response. The man responded to the invitation and faced questioning and rejection because of it. The provision. Jesus revealed himself to the man and encouraged him. Not in the temple. All of this was done outside of established religion. Jesus met him outside of the rules and regulations that strangle, the legalism that drains the life life out of us today. Jesus gives sight to all who want it, and he does it at the Father's request. So what lessons can we learn from today's story? The blind man story begs the question, could being blind have actually been the best thing that ever happened to him because it led him to Jesus? Would maybe he not have placed his trust in Jesus? Had he not been in that situation that brought him face to face where he recognized a need for Jesus? And this story also presents a good case for trusting that God has a plan for us in the midst of trouble instead of us demanding like a petulant little child, why did you do that to me, God? Why does this happen? Why do bad things happen? Could it be that the things we face may be the very things that teach us to depend on Jesus. Might the things we perceive as bad actually keep us from worse things? You know, when my son was learning to drive, we lived in Austin, Texas, two miles away from the busiest stretch of interstate of I-35, which stretches all the way from Duluth, Minnesota, all the way down to the Mexico border. The stretch through Austin, was the busiest section of I-35. We live two miles away from it. And so people would always tell me, you know, Sandy, when your son gets his driver's license, it's not a matter of if he gets in an accident, it's a matter of when. So sure enough, my son was driving the vehicle and he didn't turn and check his blind spot before he changed lanes and crashed. He had a little minor fender bender. And you know what? He never did that again. And so sometimes I think things come into our lives that teach us to be careful and prevent us from having greater tragedy. A great disaster can the start of a grand adventure or the source of a blessing. It's never that when you're going through it. It's only when you can hindsight that you see that. Some of my most humiliating circumstances have been the greatest sources of encouragement to others. You know what? You look at me today and you see whatever you think I am, but I'll tell you what, I've been where you're at. 
I've gone through that. I, I was there. I got through it. And you can too. And I'm with you all the way on this. You're not getting any judgment from me. Jesus didn't promise us a life of roses. In fact, you know what? He actually promised the exact opposite. In John, we're going to see this. He tells us, I have told you these things so that you may have peace in this world. That, so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So, no matter how awful life is right now, have hope. Life can hand out some really bad stuff. But Jesus can take anything and redeem it. He doesn't promise to remove everything. But one thing he does promise to remove, and that's spiritual blindness. That one is guaranteed. Because Jesus knows what you can become. We too need Jesus to cure our blindness. So we first need to receive God's unconditional love and acceptance. And 1 John it tells us we love because he first loved us. Then we need to totally depend on Christ as Christ depended on the Father. Jesus said, if you live depending on me, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so I want to leave you with this. These verses, if you need some go-to verses when you're down, when you're discouraged, when you're thinking, can God really do what a miracle in the midst of this mess? I want to encourage you with these verses from the end of Romans 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I want to give you a sneak preview of the coming chapter. We have more to come. Shepherds and shepherd and herding sheep were an integral part of being Jewish. There were some notable shepherds in Israel's history, Abraham, Moses, David. When you spoke shepherdese, you spoke the Jewish native language. So Jesus is going to use that dialect to give the Pharisees vivid word pictures and illustrations from everyday life. He is going to try one last time to soften hard hearts and win over the self-righteous religious leaders because chapter 10 is going to conclude Jesus' ministry to the Pharisees. It is going to be his one last-ditch attempt before the cross. <laughs>